Our nation has experienced a year like no other, and those we serve have been some of the hardest hit. A pandemic, its economic fallout and social unrest in the response to systemic racism have forced us to change how we operate, change our priorities, and change how we view ourselves and others. In the face of these challenges, we vow to come back strong. Welcome back to the 16th annual and first ever virtual Homes Within Reach Conference hosted by the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. My name is Joel Johnson. I'm the Executive Director of the Montgomery County Housing Authority, and I'm honored to serve as the Housing Alliance Board President. Before the pandemic hit, there were only 38 affordable homes for every 100 extremely low-income households in Pennsylvania. COVID has only made it worse. The virus has impacted all aspects of affordable housing, from delays in construction to dramatically altering the daily experience for low-income renters. Housing providers are facing these challenges while also trying to control costs, protect residents' health, and foster equitable community growth. As an industry, we are fortunate to have forums to convene and learn from each other, foster new ideas, and advocate for smarter policies and more resources so that a home is truly within reach for every Pennsylvanian. This session serves as the official annual membership meeting for the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania. As a member of the organization, we ask you to vote on the slate of renewing and new board members. At the bottom of the screen, there should be a link to a membership meeting ballot. Please take a minute and vote. If you're having difficulty or do not see the link, please send an email to info at housingalliancepa.org and we will make sure your vote is counted. Thanks for voting. I would now like to acknowledge the many people that are part of the Housing Alliance team, starting with all of the current board members. Thank you for all for being such a tremendous support to the Housing Alliance. I would also like to acknowledge our honorary board members. Thank you for all your dedications to the Alliance. We also want to thank our former board members. Thanks for your support throughout the history of the Housing Alliance. Finally, a tremendous thanks to the Housing Alliance staff and their dedication to the organization's mission day in and day out. In the wake of the pandemic, our collective work has become even more important. The Housing Alliance has identified five pillars for the affordable housing field to come back strong. This morning, we heard about engaging people with lived experience. This afternoon, we are going to challenge ourselves to go even further into our work. This year, everyone has stepped up to protect the most vulnerable while putting health and well being at the forefront of everything we do with limited resources and guidance. We recognize all of you for the tremendous work you have done all year. That being said, we want to acknowledge a few individuals with our frontline leader and essential worker awards. The two individuals we are honoring as our frontline leaders selflessly worked to make a difference in people's lives. Let's hear more from our frontline leaders. As a service coordinator and a nurse, the profession calls one to be of service to others. The mere definition of both jobs basically requires one to look out for, care for, and administer to others. Judy takes that to the next level. Judy herself is not in the best of health. This has not slowed her down during the pandemic. She was hospitalized for two days and was back out assisting her residents the very next day. Judy also has been delivering food to her residents in conjunction with the Salvation Army. When the apartment complex that she works for shut down their community room, Judy was thinking of ways to still have social programming and maintain social distancing. Through the assistance of many, she was able to have an on-site concert for residents to enjoy this summer. Judy often brings in outside programming. This summer, she also had charity exercises, crafts, and trivia. A big hit was also mailbox bingo. This Thanksgiving, there was a poem contest. October was You Have Been Booed. Note cards were passed out to residents to color, and then a kind note was included and sent to their neighbors. Also this summer, she had an outdoor tenant meeting that ended in grilled hot dogs passed out to all. Door prizes were even raffled. This was all out of Judy's pocket. She requested from Twilight Wish a speaker system, large screen and projector, and got that granted to her. There will be a lot of fun movie nights coming in the future. 
In addition to meals, Judy has prepared and delivered snacks to all of her tenants. This is all done in eight hours per week. Well, let's just say that's what she's getting paid for. Judy definitely puts in more than eight hours. Her love and devotion to her tenants is exemplary. Hi, I'm Mike McKenna, president of Tabor Community Services. It is my honor to introduce an award for a team member who truly embodies our organization's mission to spark the power in all people to realize their rights of housing and financial security. Andrea Grill is so deserving of the Frontline Leader Award because she has served selflessly throughout the pandemic as a homeless outreach worker, working with people day in, rain or shine, despite the risks of the pandemic, to make sure that individuals who are living on the streets or in places not meant for human habitation had a warm, kind advocate in their corner. She goes out there and she treats people like people regardless of their story. She connects them to services, provides essential items to keep people safe, like hand warmers or sleeping bags. And then she also has made sure that they are aware of other services that are out there and has actually successfully housed people directly from the street into permanent housing. Andrea is truly selfless. She does her work without seeking any attention. She works as a great partner with a whole countywide coalition of partners. And she has a great sense of humor and that she shares with all the people that she works with. Andrea, we are so grateful to have you on our team. You are an asset to the Lancaster County community and you are so deserving of this award. The two individuals we are honoring with our Essential Workers Award went above and beyond their scope of duty during the pandemic. These two individuals did not have the option to work from home because we are all depending on them. Please join me in recognizing them. Hi, my name is Sandy Sferella Taylor, Public Relations Manager for Visiting Angels York. Dorothy Miller has been with Visiting Angels since June 2019 and has worked relentlessly during the pandemic covering multiple shifts, sometimes doubles, and working overtime with a client who could not be left alone. This client is completely dependent on our care due to not being mobile. Having a reliable caregiver like Dorothy is a huge part of why we were able to provide seamless care during the pandemic. She is always caring, calm, kind, and respectful with clients and families, even during the most stressful situations. Even though Dorothy prefers overnight shifts, she rarely says no and will usually work whenever she is needed. Any shift, seven days a week, doubles, last minute, and late night call-offs. She is always punctual and is often the glue that holds our schedule together. Dorothy is older and at risk herself due to her age but continue to be committed to her client through this challenging year. Everyone that meets Dorothy absolutely loves her. Thank you, Dorothy. You are truly a blessing, an inspiration, and so deserving of this recognition. On behalf of the entire staff at Visiting Angels, congratulations. Hi. My name is Heidi Bone, and I'm the Director of Property Management for Mission First Housing. Alicia is a maintenance tech in Philadelphia whose day-to-day -day work is essential to providing safe, affordable housing for Philadelphians. In addition to providing maintenance on properties, Alicia is responsible for coordinating inspections of units with any external agencies, including city and state inspectors. Alicia is also in charge of locks and keys for the entire Philadelphia portfolio, which provides affordable housing to 2,500 households in scattered site buildings across the city. From southwest to northeast to far south Philadelphia, Alicia is one of the first introductions to our organization for new residents when she meets them at the door to provide keys at move-in. During the pandemic, many people in the organization are able to work from home. But for Alicia, that was never an option. We have not stopped leasing through the pandemic. So if a resident needed keys, gets, needs to get their locks changed, loses heat, or faces any other routine or emergency issue, Alicia is there with full protective gear and a can-do attitude. Mission First District Manager of Facilities, John Bone, 
said that Alicia has a smooth way of moving through her day. She uses her head. Her communication is awesome with the rest of the team. Even though the work of a maintenance tech can be chaotic and change from minute to minute with unexpected emergency calls, noticing unreported issues with buildings or interacting with residents, Alicia brings a dedicated calm to the work. Alicia is also the only woman in the maintenance department. While we are working to increase equity and diversity across our organization, maintenance as a field is largely male, and there are a lot of stereotypes around what a typical maintenance worker looks like. It does raise a few eyebrows now and then, John says, but her work and the way she conducts herself demands respect. She handles herself like a leader. Alicia has been central in assuring that we provide safe, affordable housing to 2,500 households in Philadelphia during a pandemic. Not only did Alicia understand and accept the changes necessary due to COVID, she took an active role in creating new procedures and policies that would allow maintenance to do their job while keeping workers and residents safe. Alicia is an essential worker who has gone above and beyond during the pandemic, providing leadership and guidance to fellow workers and solving problems that weren't even in her job description. Having Alicia on the maintenance team makes things easier for the staff, from fellow maintenance techs to supervisors, because of her creativity, intelligence, and dedication. I am so glad that Alicia has been chosen for the Essential Worker Award and thank PA Housing Alliance for recognizing her hard work in this essential aspect of affordable housing. We are inspired by the dedication and commitment of Alicia, Andrea, Dorothy, and Judy, and are grateful to those who nominated them. It is stories like the ones we just heard that keep us going. Just as we are inspired by the contributions of these four individuals, we are also inspired by the opportunities that are ahead for us. One of these opportunities is greater collaboration here in Pennsylvania with the health sector. Housing is the foundation, both literal and figurative, from which we build our lives. We spend most of our lives in our homes. The affordability, quality, and stability of our homes is directly linked to our health and well being. Ensuring that people live in healthy homes is a critical public health issue. The lack of stable housing has grave impacts on people's health. People without stable housing are more likely to experience poor health outcomes. Safe, Decent and affordable housing improves health outcomes and significantly reduces the cost of health care when compared to those who lack stable housing. According to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences including powerlessness and lack of good access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education, housing, safe environments, and healthcare. As demonstrated by the World Health Organization, social determinants of health, including housing, are important influences on health inequities. Their view is across countries, but we see vast differences from zip code to zip code of unfair and unavoidable differences in health status. The World Health Organization sums it up in that all levels of income, health, and illness follow a social gradient. The lower the socioeconomic position, the worse the health. Next, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Douglas Jacobs. He is the first Chief Innovation Officer for the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services. In this role, his three main priorities are moving the state's health systems towards value, mitigating the social determinants of health, and promoting health equity. He helps oversee the state's Medicaid program, which covers approximately 2.8 million Pennsylvanians. Dr. Jacobs is a board certified internal medicine physician, and he continues to see patients as an assistant professor of medicine at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Beginning in his medical school and throughout his first years of training, Dr. Jacobs has witnessed firsthand how health policy affects poor and sick Americans. Dr. Jacobs has written and published articles in the Journal of American Medical Association, American Journal for Public Health, Health Affairs Blog, Washington Post, and the New York Times. 
He has worked in several health policy offices in government, including the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services, the National Academy of Medicine, and the Senate Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. Welcome, Doug. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Doug Jacobs, and I'm the uh, Chief Innovation Officer of the Department of Human Services. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, I'm normally an internal medicine doctor by training, and I also, of course, work in my policy position. Um, but I, I went to this conference actually last year and uh, really learned a lot. And I also learned that medicine and, um, and the housing world really speak different languages. Uh, I think um, when I was here last year, um, someone said AMI, uh, and I thought to myself, well, that's that's really interesting why they're talking about uh, acute myocardial infarctions. Of course, I learned later that they were talking about area median income. Um, but uh, hopefully today I'm going to try and shed some light on um, these two worlds between medicine and social services. Um, I'll be speaking primarily from the medicine world, which is where I come from, um, but really um, the direction that we're moving in uh, as a department. Um, and so with that, the agenda today um, is first we'll, we'll talk about the social determinants of health um, and, and why we should care. Um, we'll give some background on uh, medical assistance, which is Pennsylvania's Medicaid program. Um, and then we'll talk about these new changes to incorporate community-based organizations um, into value-based purchasing arrangements. And we really feel like this is a big opportunity for a lot of community-based organizations, particularly those community-based organizations that really um, that focus on housing, um, and uh, but especially all the ones that are here today. Um, and so we'll try to articulate that opportunity to you all. Um, so I wanna start with um, some of the, the research that first got me interested in this space. Um, I'm a physician, I see patients in clinic, and I like to think to myself that I have complete control over uh, how my patients uh, uh, will experience their health. Um, and the actuality of the matter is that uh, what I do in the in the doctor's office, while it's important, it's not the most important thing in terms of determining the patient's health. They spend the majority of their time outside the doctor's office, living in the environment that they live in, um, having the behaviors that they have, uh, and and it just um, this is a, a graph um, that was done some of the earlier work by uh, Michael McGinnis and William uh, Foge, and the actual causes of premature death. Um, and you, as you can see, the, the medical space is really just 15% of it. Um, so much of what folks do here, uh, housing, food, the social determinants of health are really very important. Um, it's part of the reason I got into policy is to start affecting the, the broader um, environments where my patients actually live. Um, after seeing patient after patient in the doctor's office and in the hospital and treating the end, of, end effects of, of poverty in many ways, um, we really realized that uh, it's, there has to be something that we can do. And this was the ethos of the um, Department of Human Services when I came in, and I've been working with a great team on this. So some of the research really supports this. Countries with greater social expenditure have better health outcomes, even when this is tested in several different ways. Um, and higher inequality is actually associated with an even stronger association between social spending and health outcomes. It's kind of counterintuitive. It doesn't matter how much we spend on health. It actually matters how much we spend on social services that will, that will really demonstrate those improved health outcomes. Because the United States, as folks have probably realized, spends more than any other country uh, on, on healthcare by a lot. And so there's also a strong positive uh, relationship between social expenditure and health outcomes across the United States uh, states as well. And so from a state level perspective, there's more that we can do here uh, to really buoy social, social spending. Um, and so we as a state, um, as I think folks might be aware here, um, are in the process of procuring a statewide resource and referral tool. Um, and in this statewide resource and referral tool would really be focusing on social determinants of health. Um, and the definition, uh, of course, and I'm sure many people have heard this before, um, but they're the health, uh, the social determinants of health are the conditions in the environments in which people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, age, uh, that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. Um, and so with this resource and referral tool and the ability to do 
um, these social determinants of health assessments. Um, there's really nine core social determinants of health domains um, that the Department of Human Services is focusing on. Um, and you'll see here, um, I won't go through them all, they're, they're up here on the screen for you to see. Um, you can see here, number three is housing. We know, particularly with COVID-19, um, certain social determinants of health have even become that much more important. Housing, uh, food insecurity, um, and with so many folks losing their jobs, uh, these are the core areas that we know are so important to maintaining one, uh, one's well-being and overall one's health. Um, so with this in mind, um, medicine, and as I described before, uh, medicine and social services really are two diff different worlds. We have the social world uh, that is oftentimes funded through funders. Um, Community-based organizations are, uh, are used to going to these, um, these funders to um, apply for grants oftentimes where there's certain stipulations on those grants. This is less of my world. And I come from the medical world where, of course, we're used to diagnoses and um, uh, thinking about from an insurance, I guess from the more insurance perspective, how much uh, individuals end up costing the total cost of care. And so the goal with all of this is really to blend these two worlds together more. Um, so some additional background on the medical side of things is that um, I just want to kind of demonstrate how Medicaid works. Um, it's a little bit complicated in Pennsylvania, so trying to do so uh, through a diagram. So say uh, you break your leg um, and you go to the doctor. Hopefully you won't break your leg, but uh, if you do, you go to the doctor and uh, you get surgery to, to fix your broken leg. Um, you end up getting a cast. Um, and that, uh, that doctor is reimbursed by a, an MCO if you're covered by Medicaid. And in this case, a physical health MCO, uh, which is abbreviated here PHMCO. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. Um, and so the physical health MCO is, uh, is paid what's called the capitation rate. And we'll get more to that. It's paid money by the state uh, to be able to reimburse those, those doctors that are providing those services um, and other, also other healthcare providers, of course. But say instead you actually have depression and you want to see a therapist. Um, that therapist is reimbursed by a behavioral health MCO. Um, and the, the state actually gives money to behavioral health MCOs through primary contractors, which are oftentimes the county and county mental uh, human service administrators. Um, and so with this model, um, this is, these are just two branches of Medicaid that I'm talking about today. Um, we have those rates that are sent to the physical health MCOs and to the behavioral health MCOs through the counties. Um, and those are, rates are called the capitation rates. Um, the MCOs end up getting more money uh, if they're, they have more members under their care and if the members tend to be sicker. So this is really the schematic um, that we should have in the back of our minds when we think Medicaid. Um, we have a behavioral health carve out, so it's, it's paid differently than the physical health um, MCOs. And so that separation is important when we talk about some of the changes we're, that we're making. Um, and when we look at the map of Pennsylvania, every uh, there, there's five physical health choices zones. There's the Southeast, the Lehigh Capital area, the Northeast, the Northwest, uh, and the Southwest. And every one of those, um, those physical health, health choices regions um, is uh, there's a different number of um, physical health MCOs, and there might be different physical health MCOs depending on the region. Um, and so the number of physical health MCOs ranges from three to five, depending on the region. Because the behavioral health um, uh, contracts are held by the counties, there might, there's, there's one behavioral health MCO that's contracted by uh, each uh, county in particular. Okay, so with that in mind, um, I want to start talking about some of the changes that we're making. Um, and this is the last bit of, uh, of really background, background that, that I think is, is relevant here. Um, so in, we're looking as a department um, in the way we pay for services. Um, and historically, medicine has paid in a way that's called fee for service, which is when a doctor does anything, they get paid. Um, so the more surgeries I do, the more patients I see, the more money I make, that's fee for service. But it doesn't always incentivize the right kind of care or quality of care. And so 
um, we've been pushing a different idea um, that we as a department would pay more for value as opposed to fee for service. And so value-based purchasing means linking provider payments to improve performance by healthcare providers. Um, and the form of payment holds healthcare providers accountable for both the cost and quality of care that they provide. And it attempts to uh, reduce inappropriate care, but also identify and reward those best performing providers. Um, and so um, when we say value, we mean the quality of care over the cost. Both of those um, are really taken into consideration. And so in 2021, the Department of Human Services is stipulating that community-based organizations must be incorporated into these value-based purchasing or VBP arrangements between Medicaid managed care organizations and providers. And we as a department set the relative amount of that capitation rate, um, and I'll come back to that just to remind you what that is. We set the, the percentage of that capitation rate that um, that has to be linked to value. Um, and so uh, um, the physical health MCOs uh, must spend at least 50% uh, of their medical spend linked to value um, with half of that in moderate or high risk arrangements. Behavioral health MCOs, um, actually the number on the slide is wrong, I'm just realizing. Behavioral health MCOs must spend 20% um, in 2021 uh, of their medical spend linked to value with half of that in moderate or high risk arrangements. So what we mean by moderate or high risk arrangement, oh, before we get there actually, um, with the, what, what do we mean by capitation rate? Um, remember the, the money that the Department of Human Services and the state government send to the, uh, the MCOs, that's called the capitation rate. And so Department of Human Services sets the percentage of that that must be linked to value. And so what is a moderate or high risk arrangement? Um, and what we mean by this is means that um, it involves incentive to reduce healthcare costs for the patients that we treat. Um, and this is different than what's called performance-based contracting or pay for performance, which is basically um, we continue to pay the doctors every time they, they uh, do a surgery, every time they see a patient. But at the end of the year, if they had certain quality metrics, um, then they get a little bit of a bonus. This is saying we're looking at the total cost of care of the patient um, and uh, the provider is also going to be accountable for that in addition to these quality measures. So that is moderate or high risk arrangements. Um, so see, um, incorporating community-based organizations into value-based purchasing arrangements, um, there's a few players in any value-based purchasing arrangement. Um, the two typical players are an MCO and the provider. Um, but we're adding another layer to this. We're adding community-based organizations. Um, and we'll go through some examples here. But there's really um, uh, two broader ways where community-based organizations can be incorporated into a value-based purchasing arrangement. Um, and the first way is it's a vendor contract between an MCO and a, and a CBO, which affects the patients treated by the providers in a value-based purchasing arrangement. I'll, I'll show an example of that. Um, and also it can be a contract between a CBO and the provider. Um, and that provider in turn has an arrangement with the MCO. Um, the reason why this is so important, I think in the social services space, uh, uh, the social services space, particularly in housing, is that um, we, in the rollout of this resource and referral tool, are gonna be identifying more people with housing insecurity. And we know that housing insecurity is at incredible rates, um, particularly with COVID-19 and, and the economic impact that it has had. Um, but with all of this, we need to also have a way to better financially support community-based organizations. And we think that this is, can also be a uh, part of that equation. Okay, so um, we haven't, I'm gonna demonstrate some, uh, what these value-based purchasing arrangements look like now. So when MCO contracts with network providers um, to perform services, um, and those services treat a certain amount of people, um, including a, uh, community-based organization in these arrangements could just mean that the community-based organization has a contract with the MCO to provide services. Um, and it's an activity that addresses social terms of health, maybe in the case of housing, it's, it's services related to housing. Um, and that benefits um, the medical assistance or Pennsylvania's Medicaid program, the members, um, and in turn, um, that 
makes them healthier um, and, and improves their well-being. The second way that this can really happen is instead of the MCO contracting with just one community-based organization to provide all the services, they could contract with several different ones, um, housing, employment, food, just to name a few. Um, and each of those in turn could, could be providing different services to members. There's also a different, um, a, a different kind of arrangement um, and this one is called a uh, shared savings arrangement. So say there's individuals with asthma um, and they get treated by a certain provider um, and the uh, provider has a contract with an MCO. Um, and it, the network provider does a good job of improving the adherence um, for, with all the patients um, to their asthma medications. They take their inhalers more reg regularly. Um, that, it, that actually um, can improve health outcomes. So it can reduce exacerbations, it can reduce uh, emergency department visits, it can reduce admissions, which overall improves the total cost of care. And so in a shared savings arrangement, that reduction in the total cost of care, that is the pool of shared savings. Um, and without community-based organizations being involved, that is oftentimes shared between the network provider and the MCO. Now, say we layer a uh, community-based organization on top of this. And in this case, the community-based organization is providing healthy home services, uh, mold removal, putting in air filters. Um, and actually, it's been shown that, that those kinds of services can reduce exacerbations, ED visits, and admissions. Um, and that, too, could improve the total cost of care. And so after a certain period of time, that shared savings pool accrues. And in this case, the community-based organization could also partake in some of those shared savings. This is another way um, that community-based um, organizations can be included uh, in these value-based purchasing arrangements. And the last way I wanna cover um, is just an example, is that the community-based organization can also be contracted specifically with network provider. Um, that might be easier in many ways um, because uh, community-based organizations are based in a community that's in the name oftentimes, and then network providers um, are oftentimes also based in the community. Um, and then for the requirements that we're putting on the MCOs, if they contract with that network provider that has an arrangement with the community-based organization, that counts for the arrangements um, that, are, that are occurring here. Um, so certainly the MCOs, I think, will be very interested partnering, partnering with community-based organizations based on these new requirements, but also the network providers um, uh, would have incentive to do so as well. So some of the benchmarks that the Department of Human Services is actually putting on uh, Medicaid managed care organizations, both physical health and behavioral health this time, um, for community-based organization inclusion in these value-based purchasing arrangements um, will change throughout this year, but it, it's all happening starting in, in 2021. So the new agreement that we have with our Medicaid managed care organizations goes into effect uh, uh, January 1st, 2021, which we just passed a few days ago. Um, and uh, this, this agreement runs a full year. And so by March 1st, 2021, we're saying that 25% of the median and medium and high risk value-based purchasing payment strategies must incorporate at least one community-based organization that addresses at least one social insurance of health domain. And by June 1st, uh, 2021, we're saying 50% of the medium and high-risk value-based purchasing arrangements must incorporate at least one community-based organization that addresses one social determinants of health domain. And with remember again, with the medium and high-risk value-based purchasing arrangements, half of the total amount spent in VBP has to be in these moderate and high-risk arrangements. So that means that for physical health, it's 50% of the 50%, which is 25% of the total capitation rate. And in behavioral health, it's 50% um, uh, of the 20% that has to be in value-based purchasing uh, or 10%. So um, that is, uh, and if we grow value-based purchasing over time, which we expect to, um, the, the amount that's actually has to be incorporated into a, a value-based purchasing arrangement with the community-based organization will also grow. Um, and so uh, by September 1st, uh, 2021, um, I'm just going to move my picture here. 75% uh, of the medium and high-risk value-based purchasing strategies must incorporate at least one community-based organization that addresses one social terms of health domain. 
and 25% of the value-based purchasing strategies must incorporate one or more community-based organizations that address two or more social determinants of health strategies. So we are, um, as you can see, we're, we're gradually, gradually expanding this program throughout this next year. Um, and we really hope that it will allow the, uh, the Medicaid program um, to help sustainably finance community-based organizations to address the social determinants of health because community-based organizations have done such a good job of addressing these social determinants of health and have the know-how to do, to do it um, in the future. So I wanna just end today um, with some important information to know as you're thinking about um, if you're a community-based organization um, and how to, how to get involved uh, with, um, with MCOs. So it's just some additional important information to know. <clears throat> MCOs are not the same as other typical funders for community-based organizations, and it'll be a different kind of uh, partnership, and so it, it'll require a different approach than you're probably used to. Um, MCOs should be viewed as a partner rather than just solely a funder um, for these agreements. Um, the MCOs also have data analysis and patient management capabilities um, and are fundamentally different than other funders. And so uh, to really make this partnership work, community-based organizations and MCOs can really go farther by working together and learning what each, uh, what, learning what each other bring to the table, so to speak. And so the la lastly, and I think I made this point um, in various ways throughout this presentation, um, in behavioral health, the MCOs are contracted by the primary contractors, which are often those county-based human services administrators. And so for CBOs, <clears throat> in addition to reaching out to the behavioral health MCOs, um, it would be good to reach out to those primary contractors in the county. Um, and you can look on the, the Pennsylvania DHS website in the Behavioral Health and Health Choices Program section to uh, get some of that contact information. So with that, um, it's really been uh, a pleasure to be with you here today. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, I hope that you found this information useful, helpful, and together we can start to meld uh, these two worlds that we uh, collectively live in, the medical world and the, the social services world, because uh, we know that really folks, folks need our help. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doug, for all this information. I know that those attending this conference have been eager to identify ways to partner with the health sector, and you have given us the information that we need to seek greater partnerships. It is because of the importance of housing to health and health to housing that the Housing Alliance is so grateful to have PA Health and Wellness represented here. As a managed care organization in Pennsylvania, PA Health and Wellness has been a great partner in identifying new strategies to align health and housing goals. PA Health and Wellness has been a sponsor of our annual Homes Within Reach conference for the past several years, and I'm happy to welcome back Anna Keith. Hi everyone, it's so exciting to be back. My name is Anna Keith and I am the Vice President of Long-Term Supports and Services for PA Health and Wellness, a preferred health plan supporting individuals who receive Medicaid and Medicare benefits. At PA Health and Wellness, we believe in active local involvement, caring for the whole person and focusing on the lives of our participants. Our health plan prioritizes local investments and recognizes that these efforts support healthy and vibrant communities. We are honored to be a sponsor of the Homes Within Reach Conference. This past year has been a huge eye-opener for many of us about how important home is to our own health, safety, and security. On behalf of PA Health and Wellness, we wanna thank Phyllis and the team at the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania for their hard work and tireless advocacy to ensure that the housing needs of Pennsylvanians are recognized as the key contributor in health and wellness across the Commonwealth. Thank you once again for allowing PA Health and Wellness to be a partner in your housing initiatives as we strive to fulfill our own mission of transforming the health of the communities one person at a time. I'm excited about the conference. I hope all of you are as well. Uh, I wish you much health and safety in this coming year. And here's to a very different 2021. As we think about the road ahead, we know that lower wealth Pennsylvanians in need of safe, stable, and decent housing need champions in the PA General Assembly. 
Affordable housing has enjoyed bipartisan support, and we have made significant progress in increasing funding and improving policy to bring about a home within reach for all Pennsylvanians. This significant progress is a result of the hard work and dedication of several legislative champions. They are here today to talk to us about their advice on how to make affordable housing a higher priority in the coming days and years as the economic impact of the pandemic will linger for those, especially at the lower ends of the income spectrum. First, I want to introduce State Representative Sue Helm. Representative Helm was elected to the State House in 2007 and represents the 104th District, which covers parts of Dolphin and Lebanon counties. When Representative Helm was elected, she became the first woman to serve in the legislature in Dolphin County history. During the most recent legislative session, Representative Helm served as the chair of the Urban Affairs Committee, which is one of the most crucial legislative committees for much of the advocacy work we do in affordable housing, blight, and community development. Representative Helm was a champion for renters facing eviction due to the pandemic this fall. Representative Helm sponsored legislation to improve upon the state's rental assistance program that was funded by the Federal Coronavirus Relief Fund. Welcome, Representative Helm. First, I would like to thank the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania for inviting me to speak at their annual Homes Within Reach Conference. I truly appreciate being able to work with your organization to help people understand the critical importance of affordable housing to all Pennsylvanians. Our work together on Pennsylvania's conservatorship, land banks, and blight laws, among countless other initiatives, have helped Pennsylvanians throughout the Commonwealth, and I am deeply proud to have played a role in their formations. Affordable housing is absolutely essential to providing low-income households the stability necessary to engage in employment and schooling, provide for essential needs, and accumulate some financial cushion for emergencies. If you are too busy just trying to keep your head above water without stable housing, it becomes much harder to advance in other areas of your life. However, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, the need for affordable housing has grown at a faster pace than the supply. This pandemic has brought with it a new set of housing challenges for renters and homeowners. Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security, CARES Act, emergency payments and supplemental unemployment benefits provided vital support to households in the initial stages of the crisis. And the mortgage forbearance period and eviction moratoriums have provided vital stability for many families. However, there is growing concern about what will happen to individuals who may be behind on their rent or mortgage payments as a result of job loss or reduced hours when eviction moratoriums and mortgage forbearance programs come to an end, especially given uncertainty about whether there will be further fiscal support. In September of 2020, I submitted House Bill 2868 which would have provided protections for homeowners and renters impacted by COVID-19. After several months of operation, it was clear that changes were necessary in order for the mortgage and rental assistance program to truly help those it was intended to help. The changes contained in my bill would have helped to make sure that those affected by COVID-19 would have access to $175 million in funds approved by the legislature. After being passed unanimously by the House of Representatives, the bill unfortunately stalled while under consideration by the Senate. But while that effort fell short, we will not stop there. As chair of the House Urban Affairs Committee, I will enter the next legislative session more determined than ever to make housing stability a reality for all Pennsylvanians. 
I am particularly excited about continuing collaborations with volumetric building companies to further promote and advance new modular housing designs that can rapidly rehouse anyone who needs it, from storm victims to the homeless. These modular housing units are affordable to build and maintain, modern in design, and can be built and placed quickly. One additional bright spot in this plan is that the 14 of the factories building these modular units are located in Pennsylvania. Not only will we be stimulating the economy by giving people a more stable living environment, we will also be supporting existing Pennsylvania businesses. Everyone wins when Pennsylvanians are working to house Pennsylvanians. I look forward to learning and sharing more about volumetric building companies, facilities as we further explore the idea of modular housing. Through cooperation with the Housing Alliance, the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, local governments, and all other stakeholders, I stand firmly committed to making sure that we reach our share goal of making sure that all Pennsylvanians, including those of limited means, have a safe, solid, and affordable roof over their heads. My door is always open to those wishing to discuss ideas on how we in the legislature can increase and improve opportunities for affordable housing throughout Pennsylvania. Through our efforts, we will ensure that all Pennsylvanians have bright, vibrant neighborhoods in which to live and work. It's been said that goodness is defined by how far you go to help those who cannot help themselves. By making stable, affordable housing a reality for those who need it, we will be helping them help themselves. Now more than ever, we need to make sure families receive the support necessary to address their housing needs, giving them time to regain financial stability. Stable housing is the bedrock upon which people can build to better themselves and their lives. We will help them get there. Thank you again to the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania for inviting me to speak to you today. And thank you for the work you do every day to better the lives of Pennsylvanians. Thank you, Representative Tom, for your words and for your leadership. Now it's my pleasure to introduce State Senator Art Haywood. Senator Haywood represents the fourth senatorial district in Pennsylvania, which covers parts of Philadelphia and Montgomery counties. Senator Haywood was elected to the Senate in 2014. Senator Haywood has worked to reduce homelessness through expansion of the Pennsylvania Housing Affordability and Rehabilitation Enhancement Act, also known as the State Housing Trust Fund. He has passed requirements to test for lead in water in Pennsylvania schools and successfully championed legislation to relocate domestic violence survivors living in public housing. Most recently, he completed his 2019 Poverty Listening Tour and issued a report with 20 recommendations to reduce poverty in every community of Pennsylvania. He also fought for $193 million in Federal CARES Act funds to be allocated to prevent evictions, foreclosures, and homelessness in Pennsylvania during the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Senator Haywood. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania for inviting me to address the Homes Within Reach Conference. As you may know, for most of my professional life, I've worked with many of you all in trying to maintain affordable housing for those who are in need of it most. And in my state Senate role since 2014, I and my office have been advocates for affordable housing to change legislation, provide resources, and help individuals in need. Over the years, it's been so fortunate for me to have worked with so many of you as we have tried to improve the lives of Pennsylvanians. I know that working in affordable housing is very rewarding. Seeing people get their first home, 
their first rental apartment, seeing people to get jobs that they need. So valuable and so rewarding. Unfortunately, we know that resources for housing have been in decline for some time and that 2020 was the most challenging year for all of us due to COVID-19. Families faced eviction, they faced foreclosure, stress of not having income to pay utilities. Fortunately, there were a number of moratoriums that provided some relief, but I know and have talked to many that the stress of not having the money to pay bills put a tremendous crush on many families. I do want to thank each of you who fought for the $175 million of COVID CARES relief funding. We were one of three or four states in the nation that applied some of the CARES money to housing issues. Unfortunately, as a result of the program rules and the unwillingness to fix the program rules, only about $54 million was spent for housing relief. I really cannot describe the disappointment that I have in this failure. Um, I can't put it into words. Nevertheless, uh, we've got to continue to fight to fight for the families that we know need our help. And I will need you to continue to fight with me to help each other, to help our families, our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, even the strangers that we don't know. Now we've had some victories along the way, which is why I continue to have tremendous hope that we can win in these fights. We won $15 million more in fair money so that individuals can get assistance from the PHFA Fair Housing Assistance Program. That was a victory. We won $825 million in rental assistance. That's the Pennsylvania share of the $25 billion. That $825 million is far more than what we attempted to achieve in Pennsylvania on our own. And I cannot thank the US Congress and the congresspersons from Pennsylvania who advocated for these funds. It's not only that, in the recent elections to the US House and the US Senate, we won some advocates for affordable housing. And I'm so happy that we have got these victories at the federal level because that's where most of the resources are that can help us to address our challenges. Fortunately, the rental assistance money from the national government already has program rules. So we won't have to have the same kind of fight that we had with the $175 million. The federal money is already going to be directed to low income individuals who are in need. Now, this victory at the national level is one that we can build upon. And I see that in these challenging times, you who are witnessing and part of this effort, who have built homes, who have financed complex projects, who have counseled individuals so they can stay in their homes or apartments. You have the special skills of counseling individuals, building relationships, dealing with complex problems. These are the special skills that we need now to continue to build a community that is in support of the most needy in our state. Now, I do see three main challenges that we have today in 2021 and to some extent beyond. First, we have a tremendous challenge in helping our friends and neighbors and elected officials recognize the dignity of each person. I believe that the failure to recognize the dignity and worth of each person 
is a core reason that we continue to leave individuals and families behind. Let me give you one example that I encountered in a poverty tour that I had in 2019. On that poverty tour, we went to several cities and small towns across Pennsylvania to hear from individuals about how they could get out of poverty and what government could do to assist them. On one stop in Clinton County in north central Pennsylvania, I spoke with an advocate about the challenges that she faced in getting support in her community to address the poverty there. And what she shared was that she had a fundraiser along with others that was organized to raise money for individuals who needed food and clothing. During the fundraiser, she raised about $2,000. At the same time, she said there was a fundraiser by the local SBCA to provide assistance for dogs and cats and uh, similar animals. Now, that fundraiser raised over $20,000. She was so disappointed how the human life could be worth so much less than a dog or a cat. Now, I don't want to diminish our pets. My youngest daughter is a veterinarian. I've had dogs through my childhood and as an adult. However, there is no excuse for denying the dignity of each person. I see the same lack of respect and dignity for each of us in the $7.25 an hour minimum wage. That's the minimum wage here in Pennsylvania. In New Jersey, it's $12 an hour. That's about three-fifths of the Pennsylvania minimum wage. Are Pennsylvanians worth three-fifths of a New Jersey worker? No. We've got to lift up the dignity and worth of each of our fellow neighbors. I know we continue to make a case for the economic benefits that would be created, the jobs, the money that would be saved if we just spend it appropriately. These arguments are okay, but I do want to share there's a moral argument to be made that we should. And in the fight for $15 an hour that passed in Florida in November, their main argument was not the numbers, it was the morality. We have the case for dignity and we should make it. Our second challenge is with respect to public health. The COVID-19 pandemic is still with us. I am hopeful about vaccines and vaccinations, but all the calls that I've been on indicate that vaccinations are not likely until the summer. That leaves January, February, March, April, May, and into June, where the vaccine will still be rolling out. That's also when COVID-19 will still be spreading in our neighborhoods, in our communities. And that's why dealing with COVID-19 has to be a key manner for us to address. That in the housing world means our efforts to maintain uh, evictions down, foreclosures down, anything that we can do to help people stay in their homes need to be part of our agenda. I am a firm believer that the HEMAP program that allows individuals to catch up when they have fallen behind needs a significant level of funding to preserve people in their homes. Yes, $825 million is good for rental relief, but I did not see anything in the federal program that really would address the coming foreclosure crisis. We've got to advocate for funds for HEMAT so that the neighbors in our communities 
can preserve their homes and all that those homes mean to them and our communities. In addition to dignity and public health, our third and final challenge that I'm going to address today is the challenge of racial justice. Our nation is in the midst of a historic transformation moving toward a non-white majority. The Census Bureau and other demographers have suggested that by 2042 or 2050, our nation will be a majority non-white. This is part of the significant tension that we have currently in the nation around the identity of the nation, who the nation will be, who the nation will benefit, the prestige of various ethnic groups in the nation. We are a people in the housing community that have a history of inclusion, a history of trying to address diversity, a history of lifting up those who have been left behind. I don't think I need to go over all of the areas where systemic racism still persists. Home purchase, renting apartments, financing, and yes, in the construction trades where our homes are built, there is still exclusion and discrimination. We are the ones that are most likely to address these challenges, not because we have most of the power to get it done, but we have the will, the determination, and the resistance over time can get us the victories. Now, I do want to help everyone understand, or let me just share this for those who already understand. Our ability as a nation to break racial oppression, to unleash the talent that's in our communities without respect to race, that is the only way that we are going to break the chains on our nation. Until we break the barriers of racial oppression and unleash the talent that is in our nation, unleash that talent without respect to race, until we do so, our nation will remain in chains. The chains of racial oppression contain our nation today. And I know that with the hammer of our effort over time, we can break those chains. So finally, I would like to share that I have still such deep hope for our Pennsylvania, for our nation, and that hope is based on you. Seeing the insurmountable challenges that the housing community has been able to overcome over many years. I cannot thank you all enough for the work, the dedication, the hope and the commitment. Thank you again. Thank you, Senator Haywood, for your words and for your leadership. Now it is my pleasure to introduce State Senator Vincent Hughes. Senator Hughes represents the seventh senatorial district in Pennsylvania, which covers parts of Philadelphia and Montgomery counties. Senator Hughes serves as the Democratic Chairperson of the Senate Appropriations Committee, a position he has held since 2011. He has served in the Senate since 1994. Prior to that, he was a state representative from 1987 to 1994. From 1991 to 1994, he chaired the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus. Senator Hughes is a champion for major policy issues, 
such as expanding health care for low-income workers, raising the minimum wage, defending the right to vote, fighting for increased funding for public education, and rebuilding the state's distressed communities. We recognize Senator Hughes for his advocacy to increase affordable housing across the state at last year's Home Within Reach Conference. And we are honored to have him join us again this year. Welcome, Senator Hughes. Hey everybody, State Senator Vincent Hughes here. Thanks for uh, having me as a, a participant in the Homes Within Reach Com uh, Conference. It's, it's um, interesting to be a participant like this, right? You know, uh, <laughs> uh, virtually, my gosh, I can't wait till we get through all of this. My gosh, I can't wait till we get through all of this. Uh, but um, thanks for convening and thanks for being the champions across Pennsylvania for dealing with the issues um, and all of the issues that relates to housing uh, and the access uh, to affordable, high quality housing all across Pennsylvania, whether you're in the big cities or small, small rural communities. Uh, thanks for being the champions for this, for this very important issue. Um, I'll, I'll be brief and, and try to get right to the point. Uh, we, are, we are now in a period where uh, the need to step up our work and step up our effort um, really, is, really is paramount. Um, and paramount for uh, a couple of reasons. Um, some of them negative, um, some of them positive. Uh, the, the negative one is the pandemic, right? Uh, the pandemic has um, revealed to the broader community, the broader world, what I think everybody in this gathering um, has known for the entire time of doing the work around housing that they've done, uh, that, that it is a big issue, a big problem. Uh, and it's always been a very, our response has always been for far too long um, very fragile and people have been living on the edge for, for years, for decades. Uh, and what has occurred, as you all know, is the pandemic has just kind of ripped the, ripped the sheets off so that everyone can see how fragile this reality has been for millions of people across Pennsylvania and across uh, the nation. Uh, so um, our work uh, is cut out for us because now everyone can see the reality that thousands, if not millions of people are living on the edge here in Pennsylvania with respect to the issues around uh, whether they be a renter, whether it be a homeowner, whether they be in the unfortunate reality of being uh, without housing or homeless. Um, this, is, this is a very serious issue and it is now present in everyone's face. All of us in this conversation knew that, uh, but um, now the world can see it. And they can see it not just as a big city problem or a rural problem, it's a Pennsylvania problem uh, and it's a national problem. Um, and now everyone can see it. Uh, and so that's the unfortunate reality that the pandemic has brought us with respect to the issues of housing. Uh, but then there's also the reality of opportunity uh, and the opportunity mm. that uh, uh, is in front of us right now as we deal with the implementation of the $900 billion uh, program uh, that uh, and the aspects of housing that exist in the $900 billion um, federal, stimu federal uh, COVID response, stimulus response. Uh, and um, that is no small effort, getting those dollars out all across Pennsylvania to keep folks um, in their apartments, to keep folks in their homes, no, no small effort. So we really need to be in the business of implementation and making sure that we dot our I's and cross our T's and every one of those dollars is utilized uh, so that everyone gets the assistance that they need and no dollar gets sent back. Every dollar needs to be spent. We surely know that we need every dollar 
uh, here in Pennsylvania. That's the opportunity in this bridge period um, that is that we're living in right now from, uh, from the uh, end of the uh, Trump administration to the beginning of the Biden-Harris administration. This bridge period that we're in really requires us to double down and deal with the implementation uh, of these dollars to get them out to people who are desperately in need of them. Uh, but then bec again becomes more opportunity. Uh, the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration has laid out a very detailed program around the issues of, of, of housing at every level, every level. Um, they've uh, inter interceded and laid out a program uh, that um, we will have the responsibility in many respects of implementing. All of you are on the front line. Uh, you may be recipients of, of federal dollars or state dollars or local dollars or foundation dollars or corporate dollars to implement a housing program. Prayerfully, if, if we're able to successfully implement um, all the aspects of the Biden-Harris administration, millions if not billions of dollars will be spread all across Pennsylvania, all across the nation to secure um, um, housing and, and opportunity for folks. Uh, and, and, and so we're going to be the ones that are going to be driving that out. We're going to be the ones that are going to be uh, making that happen, or better yet, you're going to be the ones that are making that, all of that happen. Uh, and it'll be a great day because we'll finally have some significant resources to do the good work that we've been trying to do for so long. We'll finally have some real, real resources to work with. Um, it'll also be uh, up to all of us collectively um, to make sure that we're dealing with the old and tired, but very real issues around uh, discrimination and redlining, and, and hopefully with a strength in hand from the federal government that we're able to, to make a significant dent in that space uh, as well. So it's a funding issue and it's a, a, a implementation of some strong laws and strong policies that can make that we can make sure that the vestiges of redlining and discrimination with respect to access uh, to real dollars um, uh, and, and really secure uh, the, the, the dream, the dream of owning a home and what that means in the community that you wanna live in, no matter what zip code that, that may be, that that becomes a reality. We've got to make sure that that is strengthened. Uh, and also we, we, we're clear on uh, that the state has a responsibility as well. The state has a responsibility to not just be implementers of, of, of hopefully strong federal policy, but the state has a responsibility to stepping up in its own space and driving state resources uh, into the space. Now, you know, our office um, and our caucus especially um, has always been about the business of finding ways to drive new dollars into the housing space to make sure that we can secure people in their home. Our caucus, the Senate Democratic Caucus, is going to continue to do that. Uh, we've advocated for our own program called CARES 21. Uh, we're going to continue to advocate for that and even more going forward. Uh, so um, may, making sure that the state steps up, that the state is a great partner with a willing uh, federal government to step up that the state brings together, brings together all of the players in this space from the corporate sector, the foundation sector, state, local um, oper operatives, um, everybody in the housing space, everybody comes together. We have that responsibility. And if we have our way, we're going to seize that responsibility and do what it is that we can to make sure that the state plays a very aggressive role in this space. Um, so thank you all very much. Thank you all for making sure that the title of your gathering is not just a title, that homes and, and, and safe and secure um, housing is available to everyone in Pennsylvania, no matter your economic situation, no matter uh, uh, the geography, no matter whether you're in the big cities or the small cities or very distant rural communities that you have access to high quality, affordable housing, and that it is utilized to transfer your home ownership situation, to transform your situation so that you can mm -hmm. own a home 
and then therefore sees everything that's available to you as part of the American dream. So we thank you. We're partners. We're ready to roll up our sleeves. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all, we always have our, our sleeves rolled up. You know that. Anyone who's worked with our office always knows that we've got our sleeves rolled up. We've got a great, exciting team of uh, current senators and new senators that have joined our caucus now that have a longstanding commitment and a track record of making a difference in housing space. And we're going to put all of their talent, all of their talent, to the test and make sure that it's available to everyone to get the job done. Housing is a right, should not be viewed as a privilege. High quality, affordable housing, housing that can, if you want, can put you into a situation where you become a homeowner is a right and not a privilege. Let's make sure that that right is available to everyone. We're your partner, as we always have been, as we always will be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Hughes, for your kind words and for your advice on how to make affordable housing a higher priority in the PA General Assembly. Thank you for joining us today. We're looking forward to continuing our conference with affinity summits, workshops, and networking over the next few days. Please engage with us on social media using hashtag homeswithinreach, and don't forget to check out our sponsors and exhibitors pages. The more you visit, the more entries you'll have to win a small prize. We hope you enjoy your afternoon, and we'll see you tomorrow.